What does everyone like so much about Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door? A lot of people say it's the world, the characters, the feeling of immersion. Mario is known for exploring bright and colourful environments, but here he starts off in a town of thieves. In the first five minutes of gameplay, he rescues a girl from some attackers, and even gets mugged. It's serious this time. And unlike the more recent Paper Mario games, there are actually hundreds of uniquely designed characters in this game, with an example of the more developed ones being the girl you rescue at the start and your first partner, the archaeology student Goombella. So I want to take you through a chapter which embodies that story, character and drama. The highlight of the early game, Chapter 3 of Glitz and Glory, also known as the Glitz Pit. So there will be spoilers for that chapter, but not for any later chapters. If you aren't sure whether to get the Thousand Year Door remake, I'll show you what makes it so charming that you'll be excited to play it. The first couple of chapters act as an intro to the game, with chapter 1 being a normal, colourful Mario environment that finishes fighting a dragon in a castle, and chapter 2 showing off the visual side in a beautiful black and white forest and commanding a horde of 101 punies. As well as Goombella, Mario has also joined forces with the nervous Koopa Coops and the refined actress Flurry. You've collected the first two crystal stars, you're into the swing of the adventure now, and you're eager to see what the next chapter has in store. So you head for the third time to the Thousand Year Door and see a preview of... A City in the Sky. The first we hear from Professor Frankly is this is a place called Glitzville, and people go there to enjoy themselves on holiday. But behind the scenes, there are rich people making it big. <laughs> And we can't just go there this time, we have to find a mob boss called Don Pianto on the west side of town and convince him to give us a ticket for the blimp ride. But we don't even know where he is, so we have to find some clues. It takes a bit of searching, but we find out from another mob boss that there's a secret code that lets us go behind the item shop. It just requires buying two specific items, and then saying our favourite colour is yellow. But, uh, the shopkeeper asks us what colour our moustache is. Trick question? This kind of silly interaction is one of the charms of the game, both for the fun of it and for giving character to NPCs. I'll give a list of some other quirky moments like this later on in the video, and as we go through. We find Don Pianta and he asks us to find his daughter and her lover. And we already see not only the hard gangster side of his character, but the soft side that cares for his daughter too. He gives us the ticket we need. Now we can see what the Glitz Pit has in store. Did you know, there are currently fewer than a hundred blimps in circulation in the entire world. Maybe that's why it was so hard for us to get a ticket to board this one. As we ascend, balloons are flying from Glitzville. A floating stadium. Then we arrive and see posters on the wall, showcasing the fighters in the pit. There are lots of tourists, and a juice bar and a gift shop. You can stand behind the hot dog poster and pretend to be a sausage. It's all just like a holiday resort. We go into the stadium to watch a match and see the champion fighter of the Glitz Pit, Rock Hawk, dominating over a Koopa Troll. The Crystal Star is on his belt. That's the goal of this chapter, shown to us right from the beginning. Now at this point you'll be thinking, oh, how do we get this star that we need? 
Do we have to become the champion and overthrow Rockhawk? Our partner gives us this dialogue choice, but if you do decide to pick the steal option, your partner tells you not to play the bad guy. Well, we did have to help out two mob bosses to even be able to get here in the first place, but I get it. So we head backstage, and we already feel important. It's like going to the teacher's lounge at school. Except there are security guards everywhere. We enter the room belonging to the Glitz Pit promoter, Grubber. And we've surprised him a little with our entrance, but he gets pretty excited when we tell him we want to become a fighter in the pit. He tells us that being rich and famous is great. Dream big and we'll get big. Then he takes us on a personal tour. First he gives us a tour of the top attraction, the champion's room. Not sure about the tiger print bed, but the carpet looks like it'd feel great between your toes. And then the major league locker room. Will we get to spend time preparing for our matches in these rooms? And we're no longer Mario, we're a fighter now. The Great Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez. By this point as a player, you're feeling pretty hyped about what's ahead. It's vastly different to the first two chapters. Becoming the champion of a fighting pit to earn the Crystal Star. Now we're hooked. And I can tell you, this is only the beginning of the cool things this chapter has to offer. The minor league locker room is, as Goombella puts it, pretty gross. A few loose springs, a huge block we can't even break right now. And someone's tried running up the walls, it seems. You can tell Grubber is a salesman at heart, because he didn't show us this room before we signed. But at least we know what lies ahead, we just need to grind for it. So we listen to his assistant, Jolene, and reserve a match. Grubber even appears on the screen to wish us luck. So we start at rank 20, and it's off to our first fight against... The Goomba Brothers! Let's be honest, what other enemy would come first? Oops, don't say that too loudly around Goombella. She doesn't like that the Goombas are the underlings of underlings. And just as the rules are being explained to us, they get a hit in on us. How rude. But we can easily get a win and are interviewed just like they do on TV. There is an extra condition to the battles, which I'll come to later. So we're one battle down. We get introduced to the fighters in the minor league room next. There's a bandit, a bob -omb who often says bomb mid-sentence, and a yellow-shelled, shades-wearing Koopa. This Koopa is called King K. He's pretty cool. He actually becomes our next opponent. Every opponent we face in the pit has some character. They've got a team name and a quick trash talk. So all that's pretty different from doing battles out in the field. After we beat King K's team and a team of Pokies, we get our first hint of drama. The minor league bandit, Andy Andy, has been stalking Jolene. Bandits love to sneak around but it's curious what he's up to, so let's go looking for him. Now just a note, this is totally optional, and you can go through the chapter without following him, but it really adds to the lore surrounding the chapter. He tells us about what he calls the Seven Wonders of the Glitz Pit. They seem to be seven legends, like places where you can hear strange noises, and rumours about Jolene and Grubber. A man-eating toilet? And we hear that Prince Mush, the first champion of the Glitz Pit, mysteriously went missing. This gives us a lot to think about. When will we find any of these mysteries? It's kind of nice that finding this info is optional, because it rewards the curious players with mysteries to pique their curiosity, whereas players who just want to battle can keep doing so. When we climb to rank 15, we hear from our good friend King K that there's an escaped egg outside. We take a break from the fighting to solve a puzzle and catch the egg. But he wants to stay with us. So we have an extra companion for the chapter. The next match, King K tells us, in his own words, 
that there's someone cute at the juice shop. We can go visit if we feel like seeing for ourselves, and sure enough, cute. After another match, he's thinking of retiring soon. I know we just met you today, King K, but it feels like losing an old friend. We'll miss you, dog. So far I've mostly been focusing on the story, characters and secrets. But if we're going to discuss Chapter 3 as a whole, it's important to consider the battling, since you spend so much time doing that. The Thousand Year Door has a turn-based battling system, where you deal extra damage by timing your moves correctly, and you can time stylish moves to recharge your special attacks faster. Turn-based fights are a little old school these days, but the action commands and stylish timings on attacks make it more interesting. Health and attack is generally in the single digits, which makes it possible to strategize exact moves to win. Mario attacks with his jump, hammer, or with crystal star powers, all of which get stronger over the game, and you can have one partner out in battle to do their own special moves. Now, Chapter 3 spices this up in a couple of ways. As well as there being more character behind your opponents, you also have to fulfill one condition in the fight, which Grubber tells you. They're things like, appeal to the crowd at least once, only your partner can attack, and don't take more than 20 damage. Some of these are really easy, but some can totally influence the way you approach the battle. And if you don't complete the condition, you can't progress through the rankings. It's a nice challenge, although it can be frustrating if you fail and have to fight a lower ranked opponent again just to get back up the ranks. We start at rank 20 and have to make it up to rank 1 by defeating 9 other minor league opponents and 10 major league opponents, then above them all is the champion. There's a good balance between fighting and getting story updates in this chapter and overall it's very well done. Speaking of which, back to the story. After fighting two more members of our locker room, King K's replacement swoops in. We get to see Sir Swoop having the exact same tour as we did. It shows just how quickly fresh meat arrives on the scene in a place like this. So every challenger gets the same intro tour as us. But what's the difference between them and us? We're making it big, whereas everyone around us is stuck at their ranks. Well, I guess we didn't have to do the triple flip and meow either, but you know. Sir Swoop and all the others are probably going to stay where they are, whilst we feel special and powerful for rising above them all. And just as I opened my mouth, we're now at rank 11, but to get promoted to the Major League, we have to beat the Armoured Harriers. Two Iron Clefts. We've had a few new enemies appear throughout this tournament, like Pokies, but these ones can't be damaged. So we have to have our first taste of defeat. Does this mean our dream of becoming champion is over? Luckily for us, the egg hatches into a new partner. And this Yoshi friend can turn enemies' attacks against each other. So we can spit the two iron clefts into one another. That was close. Now we're in the Major League, fighting among the big players. It's clever how the game gives you the egg from rank 15, and we're forced to hit a roadblock and lose a battle before it hatches into the solution to our problem. We catch Grubber at an awkward moment, apparently, as he's doing something in his drawers, but he quickly gets over it with a throwaway misogynistic comment, followed by... Not what I was expecting. It feels great to be in a major league locker room. It's so clean, no more bent lockers or footprints on the wall. And then we get a visit from the esteemed champion, Rog Hawk himself comes to talk to us after hearing about our success so far. But it turns out his belt doesn't have the real crystal star on it. If that's just a fake, where is the real one? Does Rock Hawk know? It's got to be here somewhere because the map told us so. And then... This is where things start to get creepy. A 
creepy tune plays as we receive an email from X. And X tells us we need to listen to them if we want the crystal star. From this point on, the music is no longer the pumped up glitz pit theme, but this suspicious gloopy song. Well, we're a little on edge, but since we have no orders yet, it's back to fighting. After we complete a major league fight, we run into Jolene in the corridor. Seems like someone broke into the locked storeroom, and she doesn't want anyone to know about this. After another fight, we get an email from X saying to go to the juice bar outside. We turn up and the cute toad from before isn't here now. We speak to the barman and get the super hammer, which increases our hammer damage and gives us a new move for smashing blocks. That's really handy, but why did X give this to us in secret rather than in person? And they want us to use the hammer to smash a wall in the minor league locker room. Hmm, wait, this rings a bell. The sealed wall is one of the seven mysteries of the glitz pit that Bandy Andy told us about. Some say the remains of fallen athletes are stored there. So does X want us to uncover bodies? Someone has tipped off the security guard that we want to go back to the minor league. This makes it seem like X is someone who has power in the glitz pit. We've seen Grubber acting suspiciously a couple of times, but there is still a lot of unsolved mysteries hanging around, so it's hard to say if anyone else is involved. So with our super hammer, we can now smash through the rock that's been tempting us since the start of the minor league, and... Thankfully there are no bodies in here. But we find out that someone is investigating the crystal stars, which is getting very suspicious. But it makes sense considering Rockhawk's belt doesn't have the real one on it. As we leave, Jolene corners us and scolds us for being here and breaking down the wall. She takes the paper we got and leaves us feeling like a teacher has told us off and confiscated something of ours. But with it being an important paper, that certainly seems suspicious. Grubber's not the only fishy one around here. Well, I guess it's back to more fights for now. The Adonis twins come back for a sudden rematch, which is a cool twist to show that even the fights are keeping things interesting. The next email we get isn't from X, it's a creepy one telling us to keep our noses out. So someone else probably saw us destroy that block in the minor league locker room, and is trying to threaten us to stop us from going any further. Next we come across a cake left for us by Jolene, from a fan. Could this be a trap? Well, let's take a bite. It seems the cake is totally fine and heals us fully. Maybe Jolene wants us to trust her? Or maybe it really was from a fan and she was just delivering it. After defeating the fuzzies, Bowser comes in. This is incredibly random to be honest, but it's fun seeing him there, and actually the first contact Mario has had with Bowser so far in the game. It doesn't actually matter if you win or lose in this fight, you just get different dialogue depending on the outcome, but you still won the match that actually mattered, so that's all fine. X emails again and wants us to go to the phone box at the front of the arena. Rock Hawk intercepts and threatens us for stealing the spotlight, which leads our partner to think the nasty email came from him. But why is he saying it both to our faces and via email? Normally if you're going to come out in the open you don't also send sneaky anonymous emails. In the phone booth we find the key to the storage room, so we head in and... Miss Mouse, a character who appears in the first couple of chapters, is already in there. She insists that someone else must have been here before her, and she warns us to lay low, lest you end up like those poor souls upstairs. The next email talks about some stairs going up. Isn't that another of the seven mysteries? 
Sure enough, we clear some blocks and a staircase appears leading up to the second floor. Up we go. As we progress, we come across this little peep hole in the floor. Ooh, do we get the chance to eavesdrop? So Jolene is telling Grubber about the noise in the storeroom. Why is that room so important to them? They say maybe it was just a rat. She's a mouse, actually. King K is missing. And he's the fifth this year. Grubber sure seems concerned. People are rumouring the pit is cursed. And it seems Jolene is disappearing a lot too. Now, where have I heard that before? That's right, we're getting into the thick of the seven wonders of the Glitz Pit. Now that we've seen a few of them come up, let's talk about them in more detail. Number one, the sealed wall. This was the wall which we broke down and retrieved the paper about the crystal stars, and Jolene took from us. Thankfully there were no bodies in there like the myth said. This one is cleared. Number two, the man-eating toilet. Well, the toilet in the Major League locker room is permanently occupied, which frustrates Goombella, but we haven't seen it eat anyone yet. This one is unsolved. Number three, the stairs of mystery. This one is about a room somewhere that has no stairs upwards. Well, just now there were no stairs in the storeroom, but we made some up here. So that one's solved. We haven't heard any groaning voices from upstairs, but they sound similar to the next mystery. Number four, the haunted boudoir. You can hear voices from the champion's room. Maybe we'll see this one later then. Number five, the spooky ring lights. Apparently when nobody is around the ring, there are strange lights coming from under the doors. Andy says he's going to take a look into this one himself. Number six, the missing ones. Sometimes fighters disappear for no reason. We've heard about Prince Mush being missing, and now King K, and apparently there should be three others somewhere. Number seven, Grubber and Jolene. This one is about Grubber being so muscly at 60 years old, and Jolene vanishing a lot. Feels like there's more to this one still. So we've actually only solved two of these so far. There are three we know very little about, and two which we know some about, but not much. When these come up, I'll tick them off as we go. But for now, back to eavesdropping. Ever heard of the Crystal Star? Did she not read the piece of paper she confiscated from us? That paper talked about it, apparently. But Grubber heard us. We can pretend to be a mouse, a cat, or... A burping beetle? Amazing. Let's get back to the fighting. We get another threat from the non-X. We'll suffer the same fate as the missing fighters if we keep snooping? So this person has been kidnapping all the missing fighters? Now a second cake arrives just as we start a match. If we eat this one... poisons our partner and takes them out of action for the fight. So our fears came true this time. Someone does want to hurt us. Would Rock Hawk do something this evil just because he has a challenger approaching? Something also clever here is if you choose not to eat it. This blue Cooper here does instead, and he gets injured. Poor guy. So you still find out that the cake was poisonous either way. It's a way of giving the player a choice that impacts them whilst also telling you that there is this poisonous cake there, which is needed for the story, of course. Hmm. After reaching rank 1, we only have the champion to go. But we can't challenge him just yet. We get an email from X leading us to a key to the locked door inside the storeroom. 
whatever is here has been kept really secret. And we're heading to the right, which again puts us above Grubber's office, probably above the vent we accessed earlier. And remember, mystery number four of the Glitz Pit is about voices coming from up there. If only we could find Bandy Andy to ask him more about this, but he's not in his usual places in the corridor. There's a creepy breathing noise in the upper floor of the storeroom behind a large block. It's a bit like something you'd see in a horror game at this point. We remove it and... Bandy Andy! And King K! Andy says he went near the ring when there was nobody around, which is exactly what he planned to do for Mystery 5. We try to hammer them. King K won't even say anything to us. We need to rescue them now! And Jolene was poking her head in here. She runs off when we get too close. Was she about to deposit more victims? King K must have been here for longer than Andy, so maybe that's why he doesn't speak to us. He's too low on energy. And to think, he was one day from retirement. Did he find out something that he shouldn't have? Looks like we have to go back and book a match. This time it's our final match against Rock Hawk. We get led down the corridor, all the way around to the second minor league locker room? The one we didn't use ourselves, so have never been in before. And of course, we're trapped. Is this a trick by Rock Hawk to avoid fighting us? Even if he ever shows up. This does make it sound like he knows we aren't going to. This is where the puzzles get really cool. We can blow away this poster with Flurry to reveal a secret room that looks like a gambler's den with a TV. I don't even think we find out what this is used for, but it seems like an area some fighters would visit after hours for some entertainment. We keep going and find a toilet which isn't occupied this time and... Wait, we can go down it? This solves wonder number two with the man eaten by the toilet being Mario this time. And we end up in our locker room, with the bathroom finally free. We can also threaten the security guard who misled us, although he insists he didn't. Perhaps he didn't know it was a trap. Anyway, let's get in the ring before we forfeit the match. We get some fighting talk from Rock Hawk and we should have stayed locked up. So it was Rock Hawk who didn't want us to make it here, and sent the poison cake. But he doesn't own up to the emails and seems to know nothing about the Crystal Star. Seems like there's more to this mystery then. The music is incredible for this fight, with familiar sounds that belong in the Glitz Pit, but also instruments that sound like the crowd going wild. And the fighting tool pumps you up to give the champion a pummeling. So, now that we finally have the chance, we defeat Rockhawk fair and square, and become the champion. This is what we've been leading up to from the start of the chapter. That and the Crystal Star. But while we're on top of the league and have access to the garish champion's room with Tiger Print Bed, we don't have the Crystal Star yet. And there's now a voice in the vent. A ghost? This sounds like Wonder Number 4, the haunted boudoir, which said there were voices that could be heard from the champion's room. Let's see what these voices have to say.
This is a very mysterious conversation to overhear. So, King K walked in on someone with that? What's that? They think Jolene and Gonzalez, uh, Mario, are onto him. Is this Grubber? And he says the solution is to disappear us when the time comes, just like he did to the others and Prince Mush. He even thinks he may have to get rid of us just because of how strong we are. So now we know Grubber's on the bad side. At this point we can guess, since it wasn't Rockhawk, that Grubber was probably the one sending us the threatening emails. So let's read his secret paper. A machine under the ring, powered up by the crystal star, and it can suck the power out of people. Grubber walks in on us reading this and flees. So we follow. This is a tense moment. And Grubber is there. Now all is revealed. The pit opens up to show. The power sucking machine. He says it's been keeping his body young by sucking the power from the powerful people in the glitz pit. This is what he's been doing to the ones who have gone missing. And this is how he's so muscly for his age, as per Wonder Number 7. This sounds like what Bandy Andy went to investigate for Wonder Number 5, which was about the lights in the glitz pit when nobody's around. So Andy must have seen the machine and become a new missing one. Grubber powers himself up right before our eyes. It's the real final battle against Macho Grubber. He has much more health than Rawcore and can power himself up lots. Take him down. Oh. Mr. Champion? Jolene walks in and actually calls us by our name. She says she needed us to discover what was going on and promises to tell us everything. So her brother was the legendary Prince Mush who became a fighter to earn money for his family. He went missing, so Jolene got hired on as the manager so that she could investigate secretly. She witnessed Grubber transforming, though thankfully he didn't see her. She thought Mario would be the one who'd be able to defeat the strong macho Grubber. She was X. So she sent the emails which guided us around, while the threatening emails came from Grubber. She wanted us to go back to the minor league locker room to get the paper for her, to help her understand what the Crystal Star was. And while it felt like we'd done something wrong, we'd actually done exactly what she wanted. She wanted us to hear her conversation with Grubber through the peephole in the ceiling, to learn more about what she and Grubber talk about, possibly even to spy on Grubber when she left. She wanted us to destroy the block that was on top of the smushed fighters, to see for herself what was under there but she didn't want to reveal herself to us for fear she'd be discovered. As with Wonder Number 7, we now know why she kept going missing. So we clear off another wonder. Now that we know the identity of X, let's talk about some of the other things that would be going through your head trying to work out who X and the one sending the other emails are. Rourke Hawk acts the most directly hostile towards Mario, which throws the role of the threatening emails in his direction. Although, if you think about their content, they mention the Crystal Star, which Rourke Hawk doesn't appear to have interest in. The partners assume X is male without any real reason, which throws us off the hook further. 
We see Grubber doing a couple of shifty things in his drawers. So what was the hint that it was Jolene? Well, remember that pretty toad in the juice bar? Isn't it weird how she kept disappearing? Most of the characters don't do that. But she was never around when we were getting quests from X. This is very subtle, but also incredibly welcomed once you see it. Prince Mush discovered Grubber's secret and so had him disappear. But just when it seems like hope is lost, the crystal star spits him out. And with Mush returned, that's the last part of the Missing Ones mystery solved. So all seven wonders are now ticked off. Oh, yeah. We get the crystal star and the chapter is now complete. There's so much to take in with this chapter that I just had to lead you through it from the start. The objective is the star, and we initially think the route there is by fighting and chasing that glory. But then the game manages to create lots of drama through having questions flying around without answers and it's hard to know who to trust. It's a magnificently done story, which leaves extra secrets for people looking for them. It's exactly what fans of a normally story-based channel like mine would enjoy in a game. Super Paper Mario could have taken a note from its predecessor. In Chapter 6 of Super Paper Mario, you have to go through what looks like a hundred fights, which sounds like a repetitive task. There are some disruptions, which I won't go into for the sake of spoilers, but they aren't as fun and varied as solving the mystery of the Glitz Pit. A couple of loose ends are tied off at the end of the chapter. After seeing these events unfold, Rook Hawk has vowed to fight fair, which is great character development. Jolene has stepped up to run the ring now that Grubber is gone. You can go back and replay the pit afterwards, which is great for fans of the chapter, although of course it's all battle focused this time rather than having story elements. This was my first time doing a video essay, so if you'd like to see me do one of these about another chapter, such as chapter 4 or chapter 6, or even a different game entirely, definitely leave a like on the video and let me know in the comments what you'd like to see most. Who do you think X was? Let me know in the comments. You can also check out the plush video I released recently that takes inspiration from the storytelling narratives of chapter 3, but in our own way. Thanks for watching. The lonely boomer didn't turn up to his match this morning. That's another one missing. Hmm. Is someone trying to make us win? Oh! I might have to up and retire before something happens to me. If you want to save the glitz pit, do as I say. Can I see you in my office? What if it's like some kind of poison cake? Oh! Yeah! Hmm.